All right. So, I'm JP, JPR, uh, from the OpenSUSE and Genome Project. And I'm going to talk to you a little bit today about OpenSUSE and Gnome. So, first question a lot of people comes comes to people's minds is, is Gnome really important to OpenSUSE? Uh, OpenSUSE has traditionally been a KDE or desktop, sort of, that's what we call the KDE distribution. Um, but I think there's a couple important facts. One is that Gnome makes up about a quarter of OpenSUSE users. About one third install Gnome as part of a dual install. And when you add that up, that's hundreds of thousands of users that are installing Gnome and OpenSUSE. Um, I also think that uh, Gnome for OpenSUSE is an area for growth outside the traditional user base for OpenSUSE. It's, it's, uh, you know, it's somewhere that uh, Ubuntu users can seek refuge from, or that kind of thing. Um, I think it's also important. Uh, Will's talk, uh, Will and Dirk's talk just before, talked a lot about how KDE. We have a lot of KDE. Uh, we're the biggest KDE contributors upstream. Um, we also make a lot of upstream contributions in GNOME, and because of this, uh, we're probably the only distribution with significant upstream contribution and user bases in both major desktops. I don't think Ubuntu has this with Ubuntu, I don't think Fedora has this. And that makes us a distro for just about any, anyone, especially when you include the fact that we you know, also add Windowmaker, XFCE, all that kind of stuff. We have options for everybody. So the OpenSUSE GNOME community. So first of all, yes, you heard right, there is an OpenSUSE GNOME community. Um, it's sort of been around for a while. As I mentioned, we've had lots of users. Um, but we didn't really have any sort of um, uh, presence in the community, the open source community, uh, over the first uh, year or two of its uh, inception. Uh, about a year ago, we created a mailing list, we had some IRC, we did a little bit of blogging, um, kept it very low key. There was, you know, maybe 10, 15 people would hang out on the channel. Uh, those of us that worked on GNOME you know, internal to Novell would hang out there and try and talk a little bit about things we could. Uh, about six months ago, after the 10.3 release, um, started to try and build up that community a little bit. Uh, we had some external people that we knew, and we also had some internal people from Novell. Um, and it was at this point we started doing things like creating a wiki, uh, trying to get more decision making done in the community, having IRC meetings, things like that. <clears throat> so the, the people that are involved in the open system community, community, what are they doing? We do a lot of things, things you'd expect. We do a lot of work upstream, not as maintainers, but as you know, just contributing, creating the international clock, we have a panel, working on package kit to get a zip back end. Um, network, we did a whole whack of network manager work, uh, worked on GBFS, which is a new uh, piece of the platform in GNOME 222. We're also maintaining a whole load of packages upstream. Uh, so Tomboy, Control Center, uh, GNOME Panel, GNOME Session, across a whole bunch of different uh, maintainers. We also do a lot of work to work on uh, integration with uh, OpenSUSE. Similar to what KDE does, you know, we've created GAS GTK, or uh, people in the community have. Uh, the GGreeter, the thing that the first time you log in you see. Uh, we've done things that are more dis uh, dis or desktop agnostic, like Cups Auto Config. So I don't know if you know now, but if you plug in a USB printer in, uh, in 10.3, just about 99% of the time, it will actually configure it all for you on both desktops. Um, things like codec downloads now, trying to make it easier to pull codecs down, uh, things like that, things we've worked on. We've also uh, started to try and contribute to the OpenSUSE infrastructure. Uh, we've written a number of plugins for OSC, contributed patches to OSC, which is the build client, the build service, the, the local build client. And uh, just recently, for the hack week that we had, uh, we had someone, Rodrigo Moya, who uh, worked on a build service fat client similar to the, uh, the KDE one. Um, aside from development, the hacking, there's a lot of soft activity or non-development activity for, that we do. Uh, so, you know, just simply bug reporting from people in the community, uh, reviews, uh, bug re we have bug reviews and triaging, people do that. We have bug fixing weeks where you just say we're going to fix a whole bunch of, you know, bugs in this area. Uh, packaging days, uh, we do this uh, project wide, so KD people, GNOME people, a whole bunch of people contribute to this. We help people figure out what they can package, how to package, how to get things into the build service, how to contribute. Uh, upstream patch reviews, we take a lot of our patches that we do, uh, changes, bug fixes, try and push them back upstream properly. 
so they get integrated in the next releases upstream to contribute back. Um, we have a number of repositories like GNOME Community, GNOME Stable, GNOME Unstable, um, you know, where we can try and push the new versions of GNOME Unstable and sta stable and unstable versions of GNOME for older distributions. So you don't you can try the newest GNOME without having to upgrade your kernel and all the uh, uh, worries that that brings. Uh, and then simply support in the community. So you know, people answering questions, trying to help people out. Um, yeah. So in six months, we sort of got into this uh, spot where you know we have a number of contributors, uh, both internal to Novell and external um, to Novell, which is good. Um, uh, we built uh, IRC. We have an IRC channel that we probably get. We probably go for a peak in a day. We probably get somewhere between 50 and 60 people, which is great. Uh, we have a mailing list. Um, we have a, a usable wiki now that we can read and find information. So a lot of this stuff. Uh, so we've sort of built the basic infrastructure now. Uh, you know, we took care of a lot of bugs in 10.3 that didn't get a lot of attention before the release. Um, we have been working on 11.0. And we have a few next goals that we want to get to. Um, we want to keep pushing more decisions into the community. Uh, right now, still sometimes get things get decided internally at Novell by Novell people. It's not quite the right way to do it. We want to push even more out so that people can contribute and give their comments and see where we're going, and also do uh, you know help out themselves. And we really want to build that next layer of community. So a look at community building is sort of like you want to build a core, some core contributors, usually some developers. You put another group around them, which is sort of what we've got now. You know first level people that talk to the developers directly and have helped out uh, building up the community. And then on top of that, you just want to keep layering more and more people and grow it over time. Um, and there's a few sort of easier ways for people to get involved. Um, things like support, if people can simply answer questions on mailing lists and stuff, that frees up time for more development or feature improvement by, other, by others. Uh, translations is a big one. Um, in terms of translations, uh, we probably need a, a system in OpenSUSE to do translations, upstreaming them a bit better, uh, help enable the community to be able to submit them via the web, um, things like that. And then just packaging. You know, when you look at something like uh, Ubuntu's packaging ecosystem, you know, that's something that you, you really want to replicate with the distro. You want lots of packages everywhere, everything that anybody can think of. And we have a really great tool for this in the build service. Really, really excellent tool. Um, and that doesn't just do for OpenSUSE, but does it for all distributions. And uh, you know, you want to take that and move it forward. And uh, for the OpenSUSE GNOME community, I think uh, we'd like to, to move more, doing more contributions, engagements, project wide. So I talked about the translations as one. Uh, when I mentioned packaging, we're involved in the community packaging days that are all wide. And of course, the ever popular FOSDAM activity. Um, so how do we get there? That's sort of a goal, that's a high level goal, but where do we want to go with that? So build service availability. Uh, going forward, Kulo talked about it in his talk yesterday about how community repositories are, you know, we're making them options to enable as default or we're going to, uh, we want to expand our package sets that way. So GNOME Unstable and GNOME Stable are there. Um, they're not as updated as frequently as we'd like right now, so we'd like to make sure they're more up to date, make sure they're building on more older distributions, um, yeah, make them a lot more usable for people, make sure their the migration path works so that you know, if you install GNOME Stable and update to 11.0, you, know, you don't have a lot of problems, things like that. And also we want to grow the GNOME community uh, piece. So I mean, this is, this is really, the GNOME Unstable and the GNOME Stable are really the the core packages are packages that will ship on the core OpenSUSE distro. But there's a whole load of packages out there that people want access to um, that you know aren't appropriate for the core distro or you know for space considerations you don't want to fit in or, or, or whatever. Um, so I'd really like to grow this GNOME community repository. Uh, the guy who maintains it for us right now is Rick Walter, James Oakley, who also is the Planet SUSE uh, maintainer. Uh, so and he's been taking the lead and trying to get packages reviewed in there and making sure they uh, meet standards and things like that. Um, 
I mentioned earlier about the translations. Uh, I know the Fedora people, for instance, want to talk to us about trans effects, the Debian, Debian's using that. Um, I don't know if that's the right solution, but somehow it'd be nice to be enabled to enable people to, to give us translations, but not trample on upstream. Um, a little background on that. So one of the messy things about translations, like if you use something like Rosetta from Ubuntu, um, there's no real way to get those translations upstream without trampling all translations upstream, and there's no sort of way to review them, have the upstream review them and take them in. So it'd be nice to be able to uh, contribute to something like that and build that up. Live CD decisions. Uh, the presentation before, Dirk kind of got cut off, but he saw that you saw some of the uh, twisting and stuff that people have to do to get these on these live CDs because you have to try to find a balance between what people what people want installed by default and what you can actually fit on a CD. Uh, so we've, uh, there's a couple of people in the community are, are starting to look at um, what we can put in the live CD and uh, what decisions we can make there to what to cut. And uh, we'd really love feedback from this because we can sort of guess what applications that we use, but we can't really guess what everybody's using. Um, one decision that was being talked about recently was, and I know the KDE team dropped this, but we're thinking of dropping it too, which is the GIMP by default. Now, people use the GIMP, but how much do they use it? The advent of photo apps and everything, EOG, FSpot, that kind of thing. A lot of people are just using that now. So that's the kind of decision you know we need community feedback on to figure out if that's the right way to go or not. Um, more direct testing responsibility. You know, it would be great if we could form you know specific like hit squads or bug hit squads. Like these are the guys that are going to test laptops and just pound the heck out of the distro on them, or these are the guys that are going to test. Uh, you know, accessibility, for instance, we have a couple guys that are really involved in accessibility right now. Um, you know, build a great integration. Um, so upstream in GNOME, there's, a, there's a, something called the Build Brigade that, uh, I don't know if he's not here, but Rodrigo is involved in, Rodrigo Moya. And uh, they build packages for a couple different distros, but they have problems because they, they need separate machines for each thing, but we have a really great thing here in the build service that we should be able to do this with and create uh, CVS snapshot builds of all uh, of GNOME for all these various platforms and drive people to the build service in OpenSUSE. And then just you know, Google Summer of Code every year. Um, you know, we got one of the one of the best contributors I think uh, we have externally is a guy named Ricardo Cruz who came in through this program who started working, uh, who did the Ash GTK as this Google Summer of Code project. And what's he working on now, Michael? Is he for Open Office or no? But he's he's actually still a standing contributor to YAS. He's still developing for YAS right now in, in the community, even though he's a student. Um, <clears throat> so how can you contribute? So you saw a whole load of things in the previous slide that anybody can go to, uh, that anybody can work on. Um, it's important to note, I think, that no contribution you can do is too big or too small. Um, you know, I just put a sample of various people that we have in the, in the community, and everything, every little thing that's done is something somebody else doesn't have to do, and, some, and gives an opportunity for somebody to do something new and exciting in the distro, or integration, or feature, or something. So like, uh, Captain Magnus writes or just writes our meeting agendas on the wiki, and we have a guy who prepares the meeting transcripts afterwards, and we have Ivan Z, who's actually a mono contributor upstream, but he comes to our bug weeks and just goes, okay, I'm gonna fix the three or four bugs. I'm a student. Um, you know, with this PSP 250 guy who's been using Suze for like 10 years or something. And uh, he just came, showed up at our bug day and started uh, triaging bugs for us to review them. Um, this guy, I don't even really know who he is, but if you have anything to do with OpenSUSE Bugzilla, you've probably seen him reporting bugs. The, the man runs factory constantly and just reports bug after bug after bug after bug. Um, you know, Cyborg, who's also out there, who's, uh, you know, sort of the Compies XGL fusion expert guy, and also involved in the LTP, LTSP, um, packaging for uh, OpenSUSE, that helped us package Pulse Audio. Um, Ma, who's back there, is our king packaging dude. Um, you know, Federico Manicatero runs bug days, on and on and on, and whatever you can think of here to improve your distros, something I want to hear about. Um, so how do we communicate? Uh, I mentioned earlier about the wiki, the mailing list, the IRC. 
So the wiki is here. That's the lead into uh, all things GNOME and OpenSUSE. A lot of information there about packaging, repositories, uh, meetings, bug days, all that kind of stuff. Uh, we have a mailing list here, OpenSUSE GNOME at, at OpenSUSE.org. <laughs> Sorry, it should be OpenSUSE.org. <coughs> you can find it on the mailing list page. Uh, IRC, we're in this channel, OpenSUSE GNOME on IRC. Um, we have weekly meetings, although occasionally we skip one, like we skip one for Hack Week and we skip one for Fosgam this week. Um, but we also have included in that, we have uh, theme meetings. So we like to invite people from other teams to come in and talk about their area of expertise and how it relates to the desktop. So we've done this with a number of things like uh, Bluetooth, uh, Stefan Seifert came and talked about that, or uh, networking. We had uh, uh, Tamba Dingo, who's our big contributor to Network Manager upstream. I'm going to talk about that, and Helmut Shaw, who's, uh, who works on K-Network Manager, things like that. So, that's sort of an overview of the community. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the features and stuff that are coming in uh, OpenSUSE 11 from GNOME. Um, first big thing is uh, sort of the user love aspect, which you get to see, and user visible at the end. Um, we have this really cool synchronization tool called Conduit. Uh, it's maintained by a guy named uh, John Stower upstream. Does a lot of cool stuff. Um, I can probably hopefully demo it later, but uh, it uh, it synchronizes. It basically sort of abstracts everything, and it can sync to or from a whole bunch of things. It's got uh, backends for OpenSync, so any OpenSync device it has an Avahi thing, so you can sync between two machines on a local network. Um, it will sync um, from anything local, but it also sync to the web, so it can do things like. Uh, sync your evolution calendar to, to Google Calendar. It can uh, sync your F-Spot photos to Picasa, Facebook, and Mug, uh, Smug Mug, or whatever that one is. Uh, Finagra, which is a really nice uh, VNC tool. It's uh, able to use heavily for QA and testers. Uh, Gs, which is Funky Penguin's true love and it's cross to bear. Uh, trying to get webcam drivers to work. Uh, it's just a, just a cool little photo photo booth type app. Um, the International Clock, so that was in uh, OpenSUSE 10.3, um, but that was a nice sort of upstream success story. So we wrote the International Clock originally for SLED 10 SP1 about a year ago, um, but a lot of other distros really liked it. So I think Ubuntu took it and also Red Hat took it and they expanded it and they added a bunch of things and we merged it all back together upstream for GNOME 2.22. Um, and it has a couple of cool attributes too. It has policy kit integration, which we'll talk about in a little bit. And the weather integration and stuff now that wasn't in 10.3. It's also the, the only clock upstream now, so it's the default for everybody. There have been a lot of uh, Bluetooth improvements um, all over the stack, from the lowest points in the stack, the Blue Z stuff, all the way up the stack uh, to, the, to the applets and things like GNOME Phone Manager. Um, one kind of cool thing now is you really don't need the, the YAS module anymore uh, to do Bluetooth. In fact, I think they're going to drop it for everything except the server. Uh, they're going to keep it for end users, but uh, so it's pretty nice. What they've done is they debus enabled uh, the underlying daemon, and so you can tweak it all from your little user applet, and it just changes everything for you on the fly. Uh, we have a big Beagle update. So we shipped the 2.0 series in 10.3. Uh, uh, we're shipping the 0 0.3 series in uh, OpenSUSE 11. Um, it's got a lot of nice memory improvements, new backends. They rewrote the Thunderbird backend so that it uh, isn't a memory pig. Um, things like that. Uh, evolution. Uh, there's a few nice usability enhancements in evolution. There's also been a bunch of memory reduction in evolution. The biggest usability enhancement is probably the, uh, they got rid of the intrusive error dialogues now, so they just uh, you don't get a bunch of error dialogues popping up when uh, you have network errors, things like that. Uh, Avahi, although Avahi is not something specifically user visible, what you're seeing now is a lot of uh, integration with Avahi in various applications. So I mentioned Vinagre, Vinagre before, which uh, can actually find VNC server, Vino, which is the remote desktop sharing thing in GNOME, uh, actually will advertise over Avahi now, and you can find VNC uh, components over through Avahi, 
conduit I mentioned earlier will find other machines to sync to. So you can sync, say, your, your home directory or your GCOMP settings between two machines and it will find them peer to peer over the network. Um, a whole lot of other stuff. Daniel Golub did a talk yesterday actually on you know, all the various uh, integration points for Avati. It's not coming out. It's today. Right? Oh, it's today. Okay, so come see his talk today and then later where he'll show you many, many things. Actually, uh, Beagle has a, has a new feature now too where it can uh, search with other machines on the local network, finding them via Avahi, all kinds of stuff like that. Um, accessibility integration. Uh, so I blogged about this at the time, but it, it kind of sucked. But we really didn't know, we don't really, a lot of us don't really know how accessibility works or how people use it. And we shipped it and it was kind of broken in a couple of spots. Um, but these two guys, thankfully, came to the rescue and joined the community. Suze Rocks and Dara, who are big, a lot of users of that technology, and uh, helped keep us honest there. We fixed a bunch of, uh, we shipped a bunch of fixes there, but there's a bunch of new, uh, a lot of accessibility work going on upstream. And uh, you can actually hear some more about it in Michael Meeks's talk in an hour or two about all the accessibility that's going on. Work that's going on. Uh, Platform-wise, there's a few changes we made. Um, very low-level change was GVFS, which uh, GNOME VFS uh, was the sort of the virtual file system layer that we used in Nautilus, and a lot of apps used to get remote uh, streams. So GVFS is replacing this. Uh, Hans Petter, who's back there, can answer all your questions about this. He worked on it upstream. Um, <clears throat> but basically, it's much lower in the stack now. It has a very nice uh, Fuse integration now, so whenever you mount anything with Nautilus or whatever, it will get exported as a Fuse share as well, which solves a lot of problems, things like uh, third-party things like Real Player and AcroRead or things like that that really didn't speak GNOME VFS. Um, we'll just be able to grab it from a local directory now, no problem. And just, uh, for those of you who don't know what Fuse is, Fuse is a file, or uh, yeah, Files, uh, files for users, files for the file systems in user space, and uh, basically gives you a POSIX system, so just a simple, looks like a regular file system to an end user app. Uh, policy kit and console kit. So this is kind of an interesting one. Um, so both of these actually shipped in 10.3, but they're not really used anywhere, or very rarely. I think they're used for a couple of things like mounting. Um, it's not really exposed anywhere. But policy kit uh, actually will get us to um, what some people think of as, as rootless admin or uh, role-based YAST can be useful for that kind of thing. And what it is is actually it's a more granular permission system for things that you do on your system. So for instance, um, for mounting now, mounting is always, uh, for, a, for a while now in OpenSUSE has been, you take a USB stick, you plug it in, and that'll work. If you have any internal partitions that aren't mounted at boot time, you can't mount them, right? Or, well, you have to become root in order to mount them. Um, this actually breaks down those two options and allows you to set up a bunch of uh, permissions saying that, you know, I'm JPR, I can mount internal drives without any, uh, uh, without any, without root. Um, the reason this is cool is, is because you can just ship a bunch of default policies. One of the pushbacks in this uh, model has always been the server guys always get worried about, well, if we destroy root, what are we going to do? This is how servers work, kind of thing, right? But this, you just ship different configuration files. Server guys can keep their uh, can keep their root prompt, and for regular end users, we can really start to give them more granular permissions. Like we can give users permissions to add local printers and to install packages from trusted repos if we use something like package kit, but not uh, install packages from untrusted repos or install or mount external or internal partitions. Uh, the other part of this here is uh, console kit, which solves another somewhat related problem, which is uh, user sharing in the same machine. So, what happens right now is when you have something like, you go to mount something, there's basically a race condition because you plug in the key and if you've got two users on there, whoever gets to it first gets to mount the USB key. What console kit does um, is it adds the concept of active session. Um, it uses a, it works with X to figure out what the active session is. And it can, then you can do things like, um, 
only let the active session mount the USB key, or if you do things like um, switch between users and one user is playing, say, uh, music in Banshee or something, and you switch to the other user, it can take away the permissions to the audio device from the other user because it knows it's no longer the active session and give it to the new user. Um, There's a bunch of accessibility work, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, hopefully I can demo this one because this one's a little easier to understand once you see it. And uh, GDM, which is actually a discussion point for us. So they did a lot of work on GDM, actually to integrate with policy kit and console kit and a lot of this stuff. Um, the new GDM is not going to be shipped in GNOME 222, uh, but we still may ship it anyways because we probably need some testing ahead of 11.1 uh, and probably SLEE 11. Um, so what else? Desk route integration. So we shipped the Ash GDK by default on GNOME for the first time in 10.3. Um, it went over reasonably well, except for the package selector. People were really disappointed about the package selector and that it was uh, much weaker in functionality than the QT one. So uh, Ricardo Cruz, who I mentioned earlier, has actually done a bunch of work. And, and uh, you can do things like taboo packages and stuff now in the Yash GDK. So hopefully that addresses one of the big issues. Uh, GReader will probably do some uh, small improvements there. Compi's fusion configuration. Um, still seems a little too hard to me. Um, we also want to think about whether or not we want to turn this on by default. That's another thing we'd like community feedback on. But turn it on by default if your hardware supports it. Um, so we want to make this, so a couple pieces of this. So there's two main parts of con configuring Compi's Fusion. One is once you've got it running, you know, configuring the plugins and whatever, the opacity and, um, and you probably want two, two interfaces, the very simple one and the very complicated one for people who want to really care about like uh, spring constants in the uh, wobbly windows, things like that. And then the first half is the one that's um, the, really the weaker part, which is the uh, setting up the hardware. You know, GNOME XGL uh, setting or enable, disable kind of does this, but it's not very good. Um, it's not very user friendly. Um, it's not across, it's kind of known specific, some of it, um, so none of that's good, so we'd like to clean it up. And the other thing we're working on, um, we'll probably blog about it a little bit more, but... so, okay. you know. <laughs> is uh, Package Kit. Um, so Package Kit is a project started by this guy, Richard Hughes, um, who actually just got hired by Red Hat. Um, but basically what it is, is a update or a package management system agnostic uh, package manager. So what you do is you write plugins for each of the specific ones, like Yum or Smart or, or whatever, and then Package Kit has a UI for it. Uh, right now the main UI, is, it has a, a command line tool, there's a GNOME UI, uh, there is a Q package kit as well, uh, although it's not nearly as well maintained right now as GNOME package kit. Um, but uh, so what we did was we wrote a zip backend for this, and we've been working with uh, Duncan MacVicker Pretz team, who's the head of the ASP team, and one of the students that he has, uh, what's the student's name, Stefan Haas. Stefan Haas. Yeah, Stefan Haas. Um, and Scott, who's here back there, has yeah, been working on it too. Um, the idea being here is I think we can do some really neat integration stuff. Um, it's not. Let me caution you, it's not the whole ZMD versus zip thing that was in 10.1 or 10.2 because PackageKit uses zip, so it's all the tools intermixed. So it's just it's just like using zipper first and versus YAS, the YAS package manager. It's just, it's just one more interface. Um, I don't know if Duncan's demoing this while we're here, but you can ask him for a demo pretty nice. It works really nice with the new uh, SAT solver, solver. Uh, the SAT solver interface, which is lightning fast. If anybody use Zipper, you know the refresh speeds and the repos and stuff. But the new stuff is, uh, <clears throat> let me put it this way, I went to refresh my repos and I had to run it five times because I didn't believe it was actually refreshing my repos. <laughs> okay. So, what else? There's a whole bunch of stuff that are, is not really GNOME, it's not really KDE, so I call it the desktop smorgasbord. Interestingly, uh, the spell checker in OpenOffice uh, found this and put in the umbots and everything for me. <laughs> I right clicked on it. 
Um, so Confi's XGL I mentioned, there's a whole load of improvements coming there. It's getting XRander 1.2 support. It's uh, got tons of new plugins. Uh, you can see it on the demos at the uh, SUSE booth downstairs uh, for both KDE and GNOME. Network Manager 07, which is already in the alphas of Um Some couple key things here. Um, there's some new HAL enhancements that allows it to auto-detect UMTS cards. And it supports going to be supporting UMTS cards in the next uh, month or two. So this means all the broadband cards you can get in Europe and stuff. Be able to get network anywhere. Uh, PPP support is part of that. Wired 802.11x support, which has bugged a lot of people. Um, also, it has uh, profile information. So you can do things like uh, actually have wired and DHCP wired connections and have them differently depending where you are. Uh, Firefox 3. Um, I had realized that we'd made this decision. I proposed it originally, or Wolfgang Rosenauer did on the list. And Kulo seemed to have made it official yesterday in his presentation without telling me. But uh, <laughs> we're going to ship this. Uh, this has a lot of nice accessibility improvements. It's got offline API support, um, all kinds of things like that. So we're going to ship that. We'll ship OpenOffice 2.4 as well. We have a large OpenOffice team at, at uh, Novell uh, that does things like make that fancy transition, if you saw the little Prashad thing that I showed off. And a uh, whole bunch more stuff, uh, you know, just general release notes, hundreds of bug fixes, dozens of scores of new features, and uh, we just have, for ourselves, we have a few ideas we want to try and get to. So, questions? I think I'm down to like eight minutes or something, you're in. Any questions? So far? I'm very complete, apparently. Good, so, uh, demo. Let me see if I can have time to show a few of the things. <clears throat> so. <clears throat> so I mentioned policy kit. <clears throat> so all you can run this, uh, this is the new one, there's a slightly different command on 10.3. But what you have here is, is a list of basically services that are exposed uh, over Dbus. So you can see things like here, Mount fixed drives. Uh, policy kit itself, you're allowed to set up who can read and revoke and grant rights. Um, for the new clock applet, you can set the time zone this way so you can check if you have permissions or not. Um, and even actually for the new Pulse Audio stuff, you can get real time access to the Pulse Audio device if you're given uh, privileges. The question on the clock applet, sir. Yep. That seems backwards to me. Why isn't that like? Org, free desktop, PAL, system clock, set time. Is that, is that, is it, does the name of the permission relate to the tool which is doing the configuring? Or does the name of the, con or is, why isn't, the set, why, why, why isn't that named after the system clock? Because that's really what the clock would like to set yeah? Oh, because uh, this is actually, this, um, uh, the thing that does the setting here is actually comes from no panel. Okay, so that's a helper tool. Which it's a helper tool, yeah, exactly. helper yeah. tool. Basically, the way it works is there's a you make a dbus call, and the dbus call gets authenticated with policy kit, and then it calls through to what it, and activates whatever's underneath. Right. It would be nice if we could make standardize that tool so that we're only maintaining one because we want to do the same thing in KDE. Okay, so that would yeah, that would be a good. You're right. That could be a free desktop spec or something if we wanted. I don't think it's how in this case, but something. Um. So just to show you, I can go on here. So this is just a sample app that's here. But basically what you can do is you can go up here to Fromnicate, and it will let you, uh, I'm authenticating as myself, you can note. But this can give me root privilege, uh, access to run something as a root command underneath. Um, this is all controlled by just a simple XML file with sort of matching, and you can say who can get this, or groups can get such and such, or you can keep, you can ask for, the person's password, sort of like the Mac does when you do administrative functions, and it maps one user onto administrator. Uh, you can do have it keep uh, passwords for sessions or for all time. Um, and the way one of the ways we're using this now is if you go over here, you're able to see, you can set the time zone now. So when you move between cities now, you just go and set it. It'll ask you one time for authentication, and then you're done. Conduit. So Conduit I mentioned is a syncing tool. 
So I said set up a simple one right here. So Tomboy notes, you can make this a two-way sync. You can do you know, whatever you want, and all you have to do is say synchronize the group. And it will say, send my Tomboy notes into evolution memos. You can see here all the types of data sources that it has. So one interesting thing you can do is something like uh, using fspot. <coughs> Um, it's always a pain. You want to send your things to Facebook, but if you also want to send them to Picasa and to Flickr as well, you can set up something like that. Or it'll ship. Uh, you can pick a tag in FSpot, and it'll ship everything over to these three and keep them in sync for you. Um, <clears throat> I mentioned earlier, so the network thing. So you can set up actually a network. So you can say I want to put these. Actually, here's a good one. Gcomp settings across to the network. And this will actually expose an Avahi thing. You can see right here, this is a conduit exposing a, a service over Avahi. You can pick this up on another machine and keep your GCOM settings in sync or your files or whatever you want. Uh, what else did I mention? Oh, the connection editor. So we have this guy, um, not the, the UI, I don't have the latest UI on this one, that's a little better, um, but what you can do is things like, here you can now set, you know, manually DNS servers, uh, manually set your IP addresses, all things you couldn't do in the older network managers, so just try to do them automatically. There's another dialogue for doing the UMTS cards, things like that. Um, you do, quite complicated setups if you really want to. Uh, part of the work actually in Network Manager 07 was also to, although you can't do it from the UI yet, was to allow um, more than one interface to be up. So that's kind of nice for people who really need more complicated things. It also leads the way to be able to do connection sharing and forwarding. Um, uh, I'm turning low on time, less than two minutes. Is there any questions I can answer? I can, yes. Um, with the conduit aspect yep. of things, are uh, overseas you try to help um, developers able to create modules for conduit, say for instance, tasking, for example, these are to actually into, say, evolution tasks or something similar? Yeah, it's pretty straightforward. The code's organized pretty well upstream. Uh, it's all in Python. Um, so it's a Python module, and you can just basically define a you basically subclass something, right, and then implement a bunch of methods, and you have sinks and uh, sources. So, like, you can you can just pipe something. You can say, I can accept this these types of data, and you can map types of data, and it'll figure out that you know you can map files to photos and put them on Flickr, things like that. So, does that answer your question? Yeah. Also, okay. <laughs> Any other questions? I'll be out at the Open Tuesday booth, so if anyone wants to see more of the demo, I have more stuff to demo, but I'm running out of time, so. Cool. All right.